can take a seat. Good morning, Hope Church. What it do? Welcome to Hope Church this morning. My name is Luke. I am the director of connections here at Hope Church. Dave? Hey, thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> You're waiting for it. I was waiting for it. Um, <clears throat> I am so glad that you guys are here um, today. Thank you for coming and worshiping with us. For everyone that's online, thank you for joining, uh, joining us today. Um, I'm extremely excited to be preaching this morning for two reasons. One reason, um, my mom, Jan, and my nephew, Isaac, are here, and they did, they did not know that I was going to be preaching this morning, so hopefully, hopefully it's going to be a good surprise. If not, that's going to be a long three-and-a-half-hour trip back home. Um, the second reason that I'm very excited to be preaching this morning is because I love controversy. I love uh, looking at controversial things within our culture that most are familiar with or all of us are familiar with, especially when it has to do with the Bible, looking at those things, examining those things inside and out, and really trying to debunk what uh, the popular theories, the popular methods are when we look at those scriptures. So the past three weeks have actually been very helpful for me when we've been going through this debunking the Bible series. Um, I hope that they've been fresh rejuvenating for you so that when we when you are around Christmas time and you start hearing stories about the manger or the birth that you can think of the script the scriptures and these topics in creative ways uh, last week Kara preached on judgment and I have to give it up to Kara it was an incredible incredible sermon if you weren't here or weren't watching online Go to the Hope Facebook page sometime this week, sometime today. Find 20 minutes in your day, in your life, and watch this sermon. It was absolutely fantastic. If you've ever wondered about the judgment of God or when people start talking about ju the justice of God, Kara did a fantastic job. You knocked it out of the park. It was fantastic, Kara. Today, though, I get to preach on women. <laughs> okay, before we get into anything about this sermon... I need to preface this sermon with two very specific things. One, this is an inclusive, open, welcoming, and affirming congregation. We love all, we welcome all, so it is my intent and it is my goal to use gender-inclusive language. So when I say the word woman, I am uh, referring to anyone who identifies as a woman or anyone that you know that identifies as a woman. If for some reason today in uh, my language... I do not use gender-inclusive language or say something, please come speak to me after the service because I really want to learn. I really want to have my language be more inclusive of all people, and you won't offend me by saying, hey, you said something really stupid. Um, <laughs> the second thing that um, I need to specifically say about today is I love preaching. It's one of my favorite things I get to do in life. A few weeks ago, um, I was asked to speak on the movie Black Panther. We were going through the hope at the series. And, and there, Black Panther covers a lot of things within the movie, within the film, especially systemic racism. So why not have the white guy come up here? <laughs> of course you would, right? And so I got up here, and it was a fantastic sermon. I, or not like, fantastic sermon. <laughs> Sorry. Freudian slip, I don't know. It was a fantastic time. I had a good time. I hope you guys enjoyed it if you heard it. Um, but then Kara asked me to preach today on women. I was like, well, all right, of course. You know, um, I need to say this, that for thousands of years, men have abused the scriptures. And men have used the church as a platform to tell women how to feel, how to think, what to believe about themselves, God, life, what career to choose or not to choose, what to do with your bodies, and where you stand in the hierarchy of life. I definitely believe that it's because of this myopic understanding of women from these specific groups of people that has led to much of domestic abuse has led to many inferiority complexes for women, and has diminished large groups of women's gifts, talents, abilities, skills, because scripture has been taken out of context and abused. So if me as a man standing up here speaking on women makes you uncomfortable, I get that. 
I understand where that comes from because there's been a lot of hurt behind it. We're not talking about just a subject. We're talking about real people with real lives who've been in real relationships that have the scriptures been used to hurt, uh, real churches that have demeaned. And so I understand that if it makes you uncomfortable, um, that's a very logical, reasonable thing. It is my goal today to debunk those uh, and subvert those exclusive and oppressive narratives that have been told to women and have plagued the church for far, far too long. So that is what I want to accomplish in this sermon today. Would you please pray with me? <clears throat> God, make us aware. Make us aware of your presence Make us aware of what the scriptures are trying to tell us, as I believe the scriptures continue to talk to us even today, but you are so much bigger than the scriptures. You are so much bigger than a codex of an ancient text. So regardless if we um, see anything in the scriptures that become um, new to us, or the scriptures continue to hurt us, Please speak to us in a new way. You continue to speak. You continue to move. Um, open our eyes, our hearts, and our minds to you. Amen. So anytime that you read any book, any sentence from any book, you have to know what's going on in and around the story in order to grasp the fullness of the message that the author is intending, right? So how many of you have ever been just deep into a book, like the one of those books, I can't put this book down type deal, and then life happens, you put the book down, you don't read for a little bit, and then you come back to it maybe a few weeks later, and you have zero idea what's happening. Is that anybody? So I'm in the middle of a book right now. It's called Hope Never Dies. Um, my partner, Roxy, got it for me for my birthday, and it's this fictional murder mystery um, told from the perspective of Vice President Joe Biden. And, and he and President Barack Obama have to solve this murder mystery, and they have to cure the U.S. of the opioid epidemic. <laughs> it's absolutely brilliant. Please go buy this book. It's hilarious. I, like, I'll just be sitting at home just cracking up, and Roxy will be reading a book. She's like, I wish my book was as exciting as your book. Um, and so I'm reading this, but we were out of town a couple weeks ago. I was in a different state than Roxy, and then we bought a house, and so we packed up. We were moving. Life just kind of got in the way, and I came back to this book, opened it to chapter 27, and I started reading, and three sentences in, I have no idea about the names that, that this book is talking about. So I go back to chapter 25. I read 25, 26, and all of 27 just to know what's happening. Context. The importance of context. If I didn't know the context of what was happening, I would, know, I would have no idea about the shenanigans that Biden and Barack were getting themselves into in this book. And the same thing goes with scripture. The scriptures were written to a specific group of people during a very specific time frame for a very specific reason. If we do not see the scriptures, read the scriptures, understand the scriptures through a Jewish lens and, and who the audience was, then we miss out on almost all of it. One of my favorite sayings is, a text without a context becomes a pretext for a proof text. <laughs> Say that with me. A text without a context becomes a pretext for a proof text. It's a mouthful. What does that mean? Every sentence, like I just said, lives within its own world of context. Speaking specifically about the Bible, we have to know who the author was, who the audience was, why the audience, why, whoever felt like it was necessary to write a book, a letter to this specific audience. We have to know everything that's going on. The text, without the historical background, without the, the knowledge of what's going on, that if you can make the Bible say whatever you want without the information. That's called proof texting. S making the Bible say whatever you want it to say is called proof texting. A text without a context becomes a pretext to make the Bible say whatever you want. And we are all well aware of people making the Bible say whatever they want. Yes. So, for example, let's take a look at one of my favorite Bible verses coming from Deuteronomy 25, verses 11 and 12. If men get into a fight with one another and the wife of one intervenes to rescue her husband from the grip of his opponent by reaching out and seizing his genitals, <laughs> you shall cut off her hand. Show her no pity. What? <laughs> this is in the Bible? 
Yes, it is, it is in the Bible. Now, at first glance, you would think that's pretty cut and dry, wouldn't you? If you are married to a man and you see your husband fighting, if you are a woman see, seeing your husband fight someone, and you go and reach out to the opponent, and you do something and grab him, you may lose your hand. So it seems like that's pretty cut and dry. What does it mean in its proper Jewish context? I have no idea. I've never, ne I've never looked it up. I've never researched it. You know why I've never researched it? A couple of reasons I've never researched it. Because it's really funny. It's a funny verse. And if I understand it in its proper historical context, I'll understand it, and it won't be funny. So I just leave it as is, and I just try to fit it into as many conversations as I can possibly fit it into. I, I, I throw this one in all the time. But also, the real reason why I've never really looked this up is because it's not relevant. It's not relevant to our culture. This just doesn't happen in our culture. So, um, so what we do is when we study scriptures, we try to look at things where we veer towards scriptures that probably mean something to us, probably could help us really live our lives. But the funny thing is, this was actually important to somebody at one point in time in their life. Thousands of years ago, this was something that, that was needed to be written down to cover for them. So I guess what I'm saying, I'm demolishing my notes right now. Um, what I'm trying to say is um, the church in every generation needs to try to see the scriptures with new efforts and new eyes to understand the scripture fully so that we may live it out more thoroughly. And sometimes that means cutting across customs and traditions that we've been told to live into or other people have been told to be and sometimes saying, no. Or sometimes saying, that's just not relevant to us anymore. Which brings us to today's topic of women. I'm sure every woman in this place right now, probably in Bloomington Normal, in <laughs> the world, could tell s multiple stories of some man, um, maybe not all men, hopefully not all men, mansplaining something to them, or, or telling a woman they need to smile more. You're an old lady. You need to smile more. You know, those, those really annoying cultural norms that men still do today. But then you take the Bible and you throw the Bible into the story. And it kind of adds this extra level of disgustingness, doesn't it? So what are some of these disgusting narratives that men tell women still actually use today? I just wrote down four of them. There are many more than four. wonder if we've heard these. Raise your hands if you've heard these. The Bible says you can't be a pastor because you're a woman and you're supposed to be silent. Yes. The Bible says your role is to stay at home. You're a caretaker. You have babies and you take care of the kids. Mm -hmm. This one's disgusting. The Bible says you're supposed to dress modestly. So if you're a victim of sexual assault, you really need to reevaluate your clothing. Screw that guy. <laughs> and last on the list, but definitely not least, because of the order and hierarchy of life that God put into creation, women, you are inferior to man. You came from men, and man came from God, so you are beneath man, so that means you need to submit to man's authority, which whatever that means. The man is the head of the household, which whatever that means. And you need to be led by the man, and the man has all the final say-so and the familial decisions because he has a penis. <laughs> Isn't that kind of what the story is? You're a man. That's what people say. You're a man. Um, so that's the story? Like, if I can be logical and kind of crass right now, sorry, kids. Um, <laughs> sorry, Dave. Um, <laughs> um, like, a penis is a horrible decision-making unit. <laughs> if we can be really honest, how many men throughout history have gotten themselves into a lot of trouble because they've used it to make decisions? <laughs> so we need to rethink this theory. We need to rethink all of these theories. Now, the Bible speaks against women um, in the Hebrew text and the Hebrew scriptures. Um, We'll get into kind of like the patriarchy in a little bit, but the things that I've read all kind of come from one place, and that's First Timothy 2. Before we read it, don't throw it up there yet. Um, 
I want to say 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 14 kind of sums up everything that I just read off and you've raised your hand to. I want to say we're going to look at these. We're going to see these verses in, in its context, and it's going to make sense. It's really not that hard. It's really easy when we look at the historical background. Even then, if you are still not able to get behind Paul because you think Paul's misogynistic, if you can't get behind Paul because of the message that you've heard your entire lives and it's caused much pain and hurt, that's okay. You don't have to be okay with what the Bible says because it's the Bible. You don't have to blindly go along with it because it's the Bible. That is not something we are pushing on you at all. So let's please read, uh, go ahead and throw up that scripture and we'll read 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 14. It starts off with the charge to men. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. Also that the women should dress themselves modestly and decently in suitable clothing, not with their hair braided or with gold, pearls, or expensive clothes, but with good works as is proper for women who, prof who profess reverence for God. Let a woman learn in silence with full submission. I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over man. She is to keep silent. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became the transgressor. So we don't have time to cover all of that. 15, actually, there's another verse that says women uh, will be only saved through childbirth, which definitely not getting into that. Um, <laughs> Nor will I get into the deception of, of Adam and Eve. Um, it kind of goes along in the story, but just to see the fullness of that full text right there, you can, how many people like kind of like, ugh, kind of irked a little bit when we, yeah, it's kind of an irking thing. So let's ask some questions about what's going on here. A man named Paul, or someone pretending to be Paul, wrote this letter to a man named Timothy, who was a young pastor in Ephesus. What is Ephesus? Why is that important? Go ahead and throw that map up. Ephesus, you can see it right below Turkey. It's in modern day Turkey. This is a really good map because you can see Corinth, where Paul went to Corinth, Rome, Philippi, the church of the Philippians, Antioch, where the Christian, where people were called Christians for the first time, um, Jerusalem. So you can kind of see where Paul was all around. And Ephesus is on the Aegean coast. Now water, back in first century, brought, uh, brought life. Life, because of the water, brought jobs and money. Jobs and money brought a diversity of people. So Ephesus was this bustling, large city that was completely diverse, and it had, it housed one of the modern, um, or one of the seven wonders of the world. What's that? Yeah, seven wonders of the world, which was the Temple of Artemis. Go ahead and throw that up there. This is a remake of it, but can you imagine thousands of years ago this actually being built? I can see why it's a, a, a wonder of the world. This was the temple of Artemis. Who was Artemis? Artemis was one of the local goddesses, and she was the goddess of hunting, of wilderness, and fertility. And she was widely worshipped throughout Ephesus. Now, listen to this. Because Artemis was a goddess, and she was widely worshipped in Ephesus, women were sometimes equal to men in this Greco-Roman world. They were educated, they had rights, and they were equal to men. Oftentimes, if you had the right career as a priestess, you were superior to men. So women were allowed to serve Artemis, and they were in this time, they were superior to men. If men wanted to serve Artemis as like a priest figure, they would have to castrate themselves to become female-esque so they could serve Artemis in a priestly role. So as feminism grows in America... We are thousands of years behind Artemis and, and Ephesus, which is fantastic. So, so Timothy, Timothy is this young man who moves in to start a faith community based on this new movement of people claiming that Jesus has risen from the grave, that Jesus is the Messiah, and that he is the one true God. And people start converting to Christianity in Ephesus. Men start converting to Christianity in Ephesus. The, priest, the priestesses in Ephesus start converting to Christianity. This is widely important because all the original followers of Jesus were Jewish. Without Judaism, we could have no Christianity. Judaism has a long, long history of patriarchy, meaning that men rule everything, 
Women had very, very little education, if any at all, and they had very little to no rights. So can you imagine being a priestess, having all the power that you want in Ephesus, and then all of a sudden becoming part of this new faith-based system in your area that basically puts you under control of patriarchy? This would have been very, very difficult for a lot of the women in that area. They were teaching things, and we'll get to this in a second, teaching things about God that just weren't correct. I remember when I came to faith when I was 18 years old, it made a significant um, impact on my life right away. My attitude towards others changed. My, I feel like my heart opened up towards others, and, and I really wanted to start digging into this new life. But no matter, what I, no matter where I was at, no matter where my heart was at, all of the things that I had learned about God um, when I was a young boy and all of the, like, the folklore, like the myths that, that God will send you to hell type stuff, that was all with me. You know, we kind of picked those things up and that was all with me. And I remember, <laughs> sorry, it's not funny. I laugh about it when I, I think of it. I remember telling a friend um, in high school, my senior year of high school, that if his mom smoked a cigarette and then she was walking in the street and got struck by a car, that God would send her to hell because she was living, it's <laughs> not funny, uh, she was living in sin, and that's what God did because she was not forgiven. I truly believed that. So I lost Matt as a friend, and I've since apologized to Matt numerous times, and he has forgiven me. And we are friends again, but that's what I believed. I was attributing things to God that God would not attribute to herself. I was saying things about God with confidence that God would not say about herself, and God would, like, there was, there was nothing right about what I was saying about God in these moments. So then what is 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 14? Why did these verses need to be written? Because there were oppressive women, and then there was a bunch of false teachings. So let's throw verse 9 back up. It starts with the um, jewelry and whatnot. When we, um, when we read this right here, we see modestly and decently, right? Sexuality permeates our brains right away. That's our culture. You need to be modest and you need to be decent. This has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with sexuality. Nor this, is this ever a reason to tell a woman to cover herself up. Nor is it ever a reason to tell a woman she needs to put on a longer skirt or wear something different. This has absolutely nothing to do with sexuality. It's taken completely out of context for people today to tell women that they need to dress a certain way. What this has to do is the fact that there were women who had power in Ephesus who wore these lucrative dresses, who had jewelry, who got their hair did, and they had these braids and updos and all these good things, and um, they were insensitive to the poor women in the culture. So when you would go to church with these other poor women, they would make them feel hurt because of they had a lack of wealth. So all the adornments that Paul is talking about here, they're um, caricatures of a wealthy woman. So this is right there, that verse right there is all about the fact that these women were kind of being oppressive. They're changing into this new faith system that was really searching out and living for the poor. So when next time you read that or hear somebody say something about covering up or modest, you know right away this has nothing to do with sexuality. But those aren't the verses that really strike us, right? Those aren't the verses that really tug on us and go, oh, that make us cringe. It's all the verses about living in silence, learning in silence, authority, and submission. When Paul does tell the women that they need to learn in silence, first and foremost, we need to see that Paul encourages women to learn. And that's not a cop-out. That's not me taking Paul's side on this. It's that Paul is telling these women to learn, and that's setting himself apart from all of his Jewish contemporaries because no other woman in Judaism was allowed to learn. There's actually an ancient saying from Paul's day that says it's better to burn the Torah, the Hebrew text, than to teach it to a woman. So Paul is basically, what he's doing, he's pulling Judaism, he's pulling Christianity into the future of saying, look at this Greco-Roman world. These women have rights, and we need to have rights for them. So then you have this idea of these women teaching false teachings in the church. So you change a faith system, but yet you still have all this knowledge of being a priestess for Artemis. And these women, what they were doing is they were standing up in church and they were teaching things that weren't correct. They were just disturbing the church. 
That's all it was. And like if, if Dave stood up and started saying random mumbly things like he does, um, I would be like, Dave, like be in silence right now, man. You're disturbing, you're disturbing the church. This, this is all it was. So what one scholar actually says is, um, he says, um, Paul is instructing these women to learn about their new faith at this time because they need to be instructed regarding the faith so that they will be able to discern between the teaching of the church and the false teachings they were prone to. The whole book of First Timothy is about false teachings for men and for women. Now, unfortunately, when it's a woman who is teaching, remember, this is a very patriarchal religion, Paul, they are imposed to a male authority structure. So Paul says other places that women were not allowed to teach men, and this is true here as well. It's kind of revolutionary in the sense that he's allowing women to learn. He's allowing women to learn. He's encouraging women to learn, pulling them into the future so that they will learn about their new faith and learn the correct teachings. But at the same time, there is some patriarchy here, and it still feels very much oppressive. When we read this, it still feels like being silenced is oppressive. This needs to be said that this is a very local reference. Paul is writing to Timothy in Ephesus. This is not a universal standard. This is not a standard that we need to hold on to today. If Paul knew of a place called America and said, this is for people in 2018, I'm sure Paul would have said that in the letter. Paul didn't. Paul wrote to Timothy in Ephesus. This was for the Ephesians. This was some women disturbing the church, just learning. These women had power. These women had influence, and they were, they were just doing what they were used to. It feels oppressive, but it was meant to prosper others because there was disturbances in the church. That's really all that it was about. This easy. That context is easy. Why don't know why we don't teach this more, why we don't hear this more? There's so much here, and I'm going to skip around because I feel like I'm going longer than I should. Um, I could get lost in the context. I love the stuff. It's probably maybe boring for some folks, but I could go and go. Um, I would be remiss to not highlight the word submission. Um, at Pine Theology the other day, we were talking about women and submission, and Emily Dunn, she actually said, is there any point in time in the scriptures where, um, we, where Paul talks about submission as a forceful thing? There's not. There's not any force behind it. Submission is not control. Submission is not dominance. Many, many women have been told that you should feel inferior to men and submit to men. Many wives and hetero um, relationships have been told um, that they are to submit to their husbands at sometimes feeling like they are their property. Many women across the world have been told to acquiesce to their husband's sexual demands because you are your husband's wife and your husband gets what he wants because he's the man, so you are just to be ready to have sex with him at any point in time that he wants. Roxy pointed out to me when we were talking about this sermon that this is why we have the Me Too movement. This is why the Me Too movement is so important because there's this subliminal message, yet oftentimes very, very blatant message to young men that you can do whatever you want to a female and maybe not get in trouble. If you're a white man, you really aren't going to get in trouble. You're going to slap on the wrist, which leads way to rape culture. I, I can't speak with positivity, but I do not think one bit that this is the message of Paul when he's talking about submission. This is definitely not the message overall in scripture. And this is definitely not the message of Hope Church. You will never hear anything about submission being forceful or dominance because we believe everyone here is equal. And for those people, those pastors, those churches that still hold on to the archaic definition of submission and these myopic understanding of, of the proof texting of, of second, or 1 Timothy 2, I wonder if they've ever spent any time looking at all the verses that celebrate women and promote women into leadership. I know Paul in 1 Corinthians 14, he actually says that, that women should be silent again, but then later in that verse, he actually says that women should go out and prophesy. So it's very contextual. 
Other places, in Galatians 3.28, Paul says there's no longer male or female. We are all one in Christ Jesus. In Acts 16, we find out Lydia, who is an entrepreneur, she has, uh, she has this introduction to Paul. She converts to Christianity, and she actually opens up the first house church for European Christians, Lydia. Mm. <laughs> A woman named Euodia started the church at Philippi with Paul, which is Paul's favorite church. If you read the Philippians letter, it's his favorite church, and a woman started that ministry. In Romans 16, Paul refers to Phoebe as a minister or a deacon. Priscilla, she was a prominent minister in Ephesus. Her husband was also a minister. And Priscilla had a more prosperous ministry than her husband. Go Priscilla. And it has been speculated that she may very well be the author of Hebrews. Proverbs 31, if you've ever read Proverbs 31, it's this long, long list of things that it seems like a woman should be, and the church takes this way out of context. You should read it, and you'll know what I'm saying. It sounds like these really lofty expectations of a woman that no person, no woman, no man would ever be able to meet up to. But the thing is that the church says, women, you should be this. Women, you should be this. And there's no way that a woman would ever be able to do this. The context of this verse is that men honor their wives in valor. Every day, for everything that they do, men honor their wives. It was designed to read at the dinner table to highlight the woman and her importance. The Gospel of Luke promotes women to a very high standard. And after his resurrection, Jesus um, appears to women and tells them to go tell all of the men about his resurrection. Women are the first evangelists. Women are the first church planters. Women hold a very high regard in scripture. I could go on and on and on about stories celebrating women. There are so many in scripture, but they get tainted by men who have shattered egos, who is too afraid to admit that women can do exactly the same things that men can do. I get lost um, in this beautiful reality that I live in, that where I, I feel like sometimes I forget that people still think women are inferior because I grew up with a very strong, independent mom who could do anything, and I have three female bosses that, that are in, incredible, they are gifted, they are skilled, and they can lead a ministry just as well or better than any man. I, I've led a ministry before. I killed it. It did. Like, I was a co-pastor, and it went really well the time I was a co-pastor. And then for six months, I was the head pastor. Done. I have no idea how to lead a ministry. I'm not a visionary. I'm not that kind of leader. I was given that opportunity. Killed it. That has not happened here. So women, in life, things are improving. But at the same time, the world is still very much failing women. And I think that we as the church, I think we have the answer and go ahead and throw that last slide up. It's that Jesus and his kingdom ways are good news in every sense of the word for every person that exists. Biblical principles promote equality and reject any form of oppression. Sure, there are tons and tons of verses and scriptures in the Bible that when you read them, you're like, wow, I can't get behind that, and that's okay. But biblical principles that we are looking at, the biblical principles of Christ, there's no oppression whatsoever. Good news is good news for everyone. So women, we celebrate you. We honor you. We hope that anytime someone says anything to you about the fact that you are inferior or you can't do something, that you can hold your head high, that you have a community that believes in you and your gifts and your talents, and thinks that you are just as good as everyone else. This community, Hope Church, promotes you, and we love you. Let's pray. God, may our eyes be opened to all of the goodness in this world. May our eyes be opened to your presence everywhere. We are so fully aware of the things that hurt. We are so fully aware of the things that the church has said to to demean, mostly when it comes down to women, people of color, any minority other than straight white guys. 
I feel like we could just go through every sermon apologizing to people. And maybe that's necessary. Maybe we need to stand up here and apologize. But at the same time, we need to use this platform to say, that is not who you are, God. That is not our Jesus. That is not what we believe in. And that is not going to be the message that we preach. God, I hope that this Debunking the Bible series, what we've heard and what we are continuing to hear, will fill us with joy, will rejuvenate our hearts, and um, maybe help us become like you and whatever that means, living out your love to those who are hurting, to those who are oppressed, and to those who need the good news of you saying that everyone, the good news is for absolutely everyone. Amen.